again this is going to be Cindy Watts's response to Sandy's letter there isn't too much to add to this paragraph other than to say that the friend of Shanann's was our nephew's former wife Nico and that during this time we were still confused about how to pronounce Shanann's name as her parents always referred to her as Shannon and that Chris announced that he was going to change the spelling of his name at her suggestion to Christopher and I'll admit we laughed at him we never heard about Christopher again the barbecue where we first met Shanann's parents was at their house in August of 2010 it's a nice middle-class home. I've already mentioned that Shanann was much more open and talkative about personal matters than I am. I found her mother, Sandy, to be much more the same. In the first few minutes that we met, she pointed at Frank Sr. and said, I've only had three good years with that man. Shanann had previously told us that her father was an alcoholic and that her brother had drug problems, which was a conversation I felt badly about as I don't believe in airing family problems. My husband had in 2003 developed a cocaine problem, what lasted for an entire year. Chris had been at college at the time and we had never spoken of it outside our small family. But I figured when Shanann had said that about her father and brother, that Chris, or as he was temporarily known as Christopher, had shared that with her. So I was uncomfortable and sad when Sandy said that about her husband. Now, no more truthful than this letter of Sandy's. Anyways, Kathleen sent this letter to me when we were at the beach last week, and now I have read it, and so now I want to answer it. The conversations that Sandy's referring to about my remarks about Shanann loving my son did indeed take place. Several years later, following an argument and then an apology I made. I'll get to that later. As for the remarks about either her daughter being married before or mine, no, that never took place at all. This was a barbecue and we just met and I don't have intimate conversations or at least I don't start them with people I don't know. Sandy did over time let me know that she had hated her mother-in-law, but I can't remember how that came up and it certainly wasn't on this occasion. If she thought that about me as Shanann's future mother-in-law, I didn't know and she didn't say. I guess all I can say to this is we are a pretty quiet family overall. Ronnie is extremely quiet and Sarah is one of those people who truly believes if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Oh, um, for some of you that are wondering who is Sarah, they switched Jamie's name in the book. So if I say Sarah, that's really Jamie that they're talking about. And I'm sure most of you know who Jamie is, but for some that don't, that is Chris's sister. Her husband, Steve, is also quiet. It's true. So is Chris and all of us hate arguments. I think I can see how a more extroverted type of family might view us as distance, but we weren't trying to be. It's just the way we are. If there is a person in our family who shows emotion or loses their temper, I guess that would be me. But I promise that before our son and Shanann began their relationship, I can't remember a single incident where I had before. I usually just put my head down and try to forget things. Their dating and marriage changed me and not in a way I'm glad of. I'm not sure where to start. Maybe I should begin by explaining that by the time my daughter and I had thrown a bridal shower for Shanann in October of 2012, Chris and Shanann were living in Colorado. They had moved there in with the Deets in May of 2012. Chris had taken a job at Longmont Ford. We didn't have any gatherings before she flew back to North Carolina for the pre-wedding stuff. As to the engagement party, I'm assuming is what Sandy is speaking of, the bridal shower we gave her, which I have already addressed. Shanann's second engagement party was given by Nicole Kennedy, who was Shanann's matron of honor. And we had nothing to do with food or invitations, anything at all. In fact, we didn't even attend that one. I heard about it later from a family's friends who did. Apparently, Nicole made a toast and said humorously, I know there are people who would like to kill me for bringing these two together. I think that's so ironic right now. Now I guess I better explain our absence from the second engagement party. 
There had been an earlier engagement party that was thrown by another friend of Shanann's. Ronnie and I did go, and for whatever reason, we seriously screwed up in Chris's eyes because he called us the next morning and said that we had really embarrassed him the night before. This came out of the blue to Ronnie and me, and I was particularly upset by it. So we canceled our plans to attend the second party as to avoid embarrassing Chris again. If you're beginning to wonder if I ever realized that it wasn't only Shanann who didn't seem to like us, or at least like me, yeah, I did catch that a while back. What I didn't see was this. If you had asked me if I had a good relationship with my son before he met and fell in love and married Shanann, and if I thought that he loved me, I would have answered yes to both. I would have blamed her for how he had begun to treat us, but I don't know now if that was true. I have to wonder what I still don't question is that I have always loved him and that I always will. But I guess if you're wondering if I know him or ever really did, again, I would say I thought so once and now I don't. The next chapter I am told deals with the wedding and so I'll leave off answering that portion of Sandy's letter. I will tell you that following the wedding, I think I expected our son to apologize to us, but he never did. Instead, he wrote me the longest, ugliest email I've ever received. When Sarah came by the house later that day, she found me sobbing on the floor. She didn't comfort me. She said, get up, get up. This is how things are now, and you have to face them and be strong. I tried to do what she said. It was good advice. Following the wedding, we did not hear from Chris until we contacted him in April of 2012. After friends told us that he and Shanann had announced that she was pregnant on Facebook. Chris spoiled Shanann and vice versa. They were so in love. They were a great team. They moved to Colorado and lived with Shanann's friend for one year while they were building their house. Everything was great. So right here I'm gonna let you guys read this part for yourself and then I'll go over it and you guys come up with your own theory of what you believe on it. So right here we clearly have two different stories for what happened with Chris and the cancer. So Sandy says that Chris went to the doctor, Shanann noticed it and she saved his life and they removed it. Cindy says that Shanann sent a photo of his private area and he never went to the doctors and they never discussed it after that photo. So who knows what really took place with this whole situation or what's the real story behind it all? Shanann's pregnancy was announced on Facebook in April. We contacted them and everybody agreed to a fresh start. Brandon and I don't have much money, but we bought the $600 stroller she asked for as a gesture of goodwill. And Sandy's right, both families seemed happy. We were, I think, maybe more relieved than happy. I mean, we were very happy about our new grandchild, but by then we were so upset that Chris had refused to talk to us for months that we had long before begun blaming ourselves for it. We had to make up for not going to the wedding. We would do whatever he wanted, whatever she wanted. I don't know how long Shanann was at Longmont for. A few months, she quit while pregnant. It was not a high-risk pregnancy and there were no fertility drugs as far as we knew. They were married in November and she was pregnant by February or March. And usually four months is not considered a long trying period for a baby. Chris was not the head mechanic at Longmont Ford. That can take years and he was only there about a year. He was a line mechanic. But he was working six days a week and making between 60 and 80,000 during that year. It's probably how he was able to qualify for the house in Frederick. Shanann did not get any money from her house in North Carolina and had to sell it furnished. Whatever happened during that sale must have hurt her credit, so Chris had to apply for the loan alone. His job at Longmont was a really good one for him, but it was six days a week and that annoyed Shanann. She told him he had carpal tunnel syndrome from work and needed to quit. So he did and began at Anadarko at about 20000 less than he'd been making. They did not build their house. It was a pre-planned subdivision, and that was one of the different models available. The largest one at the time. Later, some had three-car garages. 
If Shanann was having a high-risk pregnancy, no one including either she or Chris mentioned it. She looked fine, seemed happy and healthy, and Bella was a beautiful happy baby. I think they were struggling financially though. Shanann had been given some shift work at Children's. Sandy said her friend Jenna was there as a nursing supervisor, but the shifts were infrequent. I don't know if she made any money or not on the handbags. They were young and they had a baby with another on the way, and a huge mortgage and only one car, Chris's Mustang. They didn't have any furniture, so they ran up some pretty high credit card bills furnishing the house. And so I guess they probably did feel somewhat overwhelmed and wanted some help from Sandy and Frank. I think family's important too. I worked for 30 years in credit control, and when Ronnie and I had our babies, my mom watched them during the day. And when I retired, I started getting to have Sarah's babies during the day. And it's a fine thing, a blessing in my life. I think that's why one of the reasons we were so surprised when they just moved out to Colorado. No family. We weren't thinking at the time there would be any babies for them though. Shanann had told my best friend at their post-wedding breakfast, Oh, Cindy's going to be so mad at me again. I have endometriosis and won't be able to have any children. I shrugged it off. She already told us that she also had lupus and fibromyalgia and celiac disease. I guess I hadn't ever thought about grandchildren from Shanann and Chris, and I didn't mind. We have grandchildren, so it was quite a surprise that she ended up being able to have babies, but a nice one. Sometime during the year before Cece was born, Frankie had come out to stay with them. Shanann said it was to help him with his drug problem. I don't know if Frankie ever had a drug problem or not. She also told us that he and her mom were bipolar. I'll admit, I thought Sandy would be a little overbearing, but she wasn't crazy or anything. And Frankie, he's just a sweetheart, always has been. I guess if I thought anyone was bipolar around there, it was Shanann. At any rate, he left after a few weeks, later telling us he hadn't much liked being their butler. I thought it was funny. He's always been a very nice kid, Frankie, and our whole family likes him a lot and are sorry that we can't talk anymore. One more thing to be sorry about. It's true that Sarah never went to Colorado. She wasn't interested, but for that matter, Frankie never went back either. So it wasn't until Shanann came for her six week stay in 2018 that either Sarah or Frankie got to meet Cece face to face for the first time. Sandy is right, they did just that. They sold everything they had, including this really pretty pond with koi in it. They moved to Colorado, and despite Shanann and Chris having five bedroom house, Sandy and Frank were put down in the unfurnished basement. The way the bedroom situation worked was very specific. Master bedroom was for Chris and Shanann. The girls each had their own room, and that was never open for discussion, because they might keep each other awake. The remaining rooms were Shanann's office, I think she was selling both Unique and Lulu Row by then. And the girls' playroom because Shanann didn't like toys in their bedroom, so Sandy and Frank had the basement. They also, according to what Sandy told me, had to pay $1,000 a month and were there to help with the kids. At the time they came, Chris and Shanann told us that it had been Frank and Sandy's choice alone because they wanted to be near their grandchildren. That made sense to me and Ronnie, but I think it was hard on them financially because they had to pay the mortgage on their house in North Carolina where Frankie was still living and pay rent in Colorado too. They both had to get jobs. Sandy was a hairdresser. She got work doing that. And Frank drove a delivery truck for either Lowe's or Home Depot. I can't remember for sure which one. Their jobs helped with their finances but left Shanann short on childcare during the day. So she enrolled both girls at Primrose School. I'll give Sandy this much. That was a pretty disastrous trip to Colorado. Chris and Shanann had asked me to come and take care of the girls so they can go to, I think it was Punta Cana, for a Thrive thing, which Shanann had started selling by then. I said yes. They sent me a ticket and Shanann offered to keep the girls in daycare if I wanted. But I said no. And the three of us had a good time during the day in their subdivision. I think it's hilarious how she has to point out the subdivision. <laughs> it was a nice, it was nice, very nice there, and all set up for families. 
Sandy didn't seem to want me there and made me nervous by getting angry at me after she said I scratched one of Shanann's frying pans. The part about the girls not eating dinner downstairs is ridiculous. No one in their right mind would have tried to eat food anywhere in Chris and Shanann's house except the kitchen counter or the dining room if they knew what was good for them. I don't blame her. I don't like when people eat in other areas of the house either. And I had to keep their totally set in stone bedtime ritual, snack, shower, or bath, Tylenol, bed by seven at the latest. No exceptions. One evening when Sandy had gotten home from work, the girls wanted me to take them to the basement where their bouncy house was. I did and Sandy got in it with them and they were having a good time. Then Sandy said I needed to bounce too. I said no. I'll just watch. She told me, you don't know anything about children, Cindy. I was mad, I'll admit. Then it got worse because it was 6.30 and I had to keep the girls on their schedule. So I took them upstairs and they weren't happy. I don't blame them, but those were the rules. They both had tantrums and Sandy came storming up and told me I was doing it wrong. Not sure what it was, but it was wrong. I had it. I did scream. What the hell am I here for? And I did do it in front of Bella and Cece. Then I stomped off downstairs and sat on the couch and cried. And then I just walked back upstairs and found Sandy in Cece's room and I apologized. We actually had a nice talk after that. And she told me she loved Chris, but that he didn't speak up enough. When Chris and Shanann got back, there was a big fight between Sandy and Shanann. And Sandy packed up their car, her dogs included, in such a hurry that she didn't even have time to say goodbye to the girls or Chris. Shanann asked Frank to let her go and stay with her, but he didn't. He got in the car too. And they drove back to North Carolina, and that was that. God help us all. They are all dead, and he killed them, and I don't have any answers. Just grief and endless regret. Did I make him this way? Should have I done more? Done less? What could have I done differently? Could I have stopped it? I miss those little girls. I will always miss them. But what is worse is that they lost their lives. All the long years that belonged to them by right. He took those years and I don't know if he understands at all what he has done to us and the Ruseks, the people left behind. I always told myself he was like Ronnie because Ronnie has always been quiet but he's nothing like Ronnie. I don't know. I spent all day and night, a year later, still trying to find something, anything that I missed. And I must have, but I don't have any answers. We have grief. It will always be with us. I know grief. It walks with me. I know confusion and despair, but I don't think I know my son. Everything seemed fine. Sandy and Frank were way ahead of us then. Chris never told us about the bankruptcy at all. I found out later, after, and there wasn't much in the way of medical debt in 2015 when they declared. There was 70000 in unsecured debt, however. Stuff they bought. Somewhere in there, Chris had sold his Mustang to get cash for the Lexus down payment lease. By then, he had his work truck. When I look at the bankruptcy filing, so much money. And for what? Clothes? Trips? They couldn't afford? Sandy and Frank had to give them money for their passport for Putacana if they couldn't pay for that. What in the world did they go on the trip for? Any of those trips, they were just parties where they bought more overpriced clothing. This time, Thrive Stuff. It was crazy spending. Chris claims now he didn't know how bad their money situation was. I said, really? Two years later, they were right again. And it's not hard to figure, is it? He was making 60000 a year. Their mortgage was 2700 Another 150 for homeowners. 2000 a month for daycare. 600 a month for a car payment, not counting insurance. They were already in the negative before utilities and food. So why not go on pricey trips and buy clothes and toys and get your nails done on Shanann's part? They treated money like Monopoly cash, and two short years later, they were underwater again, having learned nothing. And apparently, neither had their banks, because how anyone was stupid enough to give those two credit is beyond me. 
it's true that both the girls suffered from failure to diagnose or to get the right diagnosis that people in their lives seem to need for them. That's very interesting how she says that. Neither of the girls displayed any asthmatic symptoms when I was there. And Chris admits now that the most he saw was Cece coughing sometimes when she ate too fast. Bella did not suffer from any allergies at all. Despite, she was told that whatever Cece was allergic to, and sometimes that was chocolate, sometimes peanuts, and later tree nuts. She was not allowed any of those things either. Four is young for this. I don't know which of them, Chris or Shanann, told that to if Cece ate coconut, she wouldn't wake up. I wish no one had. She was very quiet, gentle, frightened little girl. And after the age of two, she never looked healthy and her hair wouldn't grow. And she was self-conscious about it. Now I know she had added worry to her sister dying on her little shoulders. Mama bear, Shanann called her. She wasn't a mama bear. She was a baby, but she was right to worry. I guess because her sister did die, didn't she? Chris killed her, killed them both. I don't think they had any allergies at all. I just want to say something that Vala did believe that um, if Cece ate coconut, she would die because when they interviewed the babysitter, that is one thing that the babysitter said that Bella couldn't sleep and that she had told her that if Cece ever ate coconut, she would die and Bella looked really upset about it. And I always felt that that's just so heartbreaking for a little four-year-old to have to comprehend and, and have to deal with that emotionally. I don't think they should have been dosed up with Tylenol every single night of their lives. And here's another thing that haunts me. The last day of their lives, they went to a birthday party and there was cake and ice cream and those babies had to stand and look at it. None for them. Not even on the last day of their lives. This is the one photo for myself um, that always bothers me every time I see it because it's Chris in the corner looking like a creep in my opinion he looks just to me he looks like he's on drugs or I don't know what's wrong with his face then you have sweet Bella behind the birthday boy and the little boy is gonna I guess blow out his candles and you see Bella like reaching over kind of trying to look at the cake and she just is looking at the cake with this sweet sweet little face of hers like she wants some and it just pisses me off because Chris has said that he was planning for weeks of these murders. Whether you believe him or you don't, this is what he said. If you knew you were going to murder your children that night, why didn't you let Bella have a piece of cake? She was not allergic to the cake. Only Cece was. So that's something that just always bothers me that he couldn't let Bella enjoy cake and ice cream knowing it would be the last opportunity she would have to have it. I don't know, I just, that always upsets me with that. Okay, I'm done, moving along. Sandy must be referring to the second go round of debt here because Shanann's neck surgery was after the bankruptcy. It was elective and so costly as were most of the tests on the girls. If Cece was born with anything wrong with her, it sure never showed. She was the healthiest, most active, and happiest little girl. I hate that she went through all those procedures and all those drugs. From birth, both girls were left to cry out. Chris and Shanann said it was something called baby wise. I thought it was horrible. Two hour naps unless they were at daycare? Drugs at 6 p.m. every single night? Sick or not? bed at 6 30 or 7 at the latest those loud rain machines i was told never to go into them when they cried no rocking ever i watched bella crawl out of bed in the dark and crawl to her bookshelf then sit in a corner holding a book she couldn't see in the dark if the children had really had asthma wouldn't having let them cry like that have set off the asthma or cc's choking I just want to say 
hearing that Bella as a small child crawling to her bookshelf and holding a book in the dark, I find her books comforted her. And in the body cam, the dog alerts to Bella's bed, um, underneath her bed, around her bed area. And when they look underneath her bed, they find one of Bella's books underneath there and a rock. Um, and I can't help but wonder if that night, this is my opinion, speculating, um, if Bella woke up and seen something, heard something, and was terrified, and she grabbed one of her books because it comforts her, and she hid underneath her bed. I don't know. I, I've always felt that ever since I've seen the body cam video and then seen videos of Bella, you know, when she gets scared, she hides under the, underneath the table. There's a video of that, so... I don't know, that's just something that I've always felt. All I can say to this is that they were a very strange family. My son, his wife, her parents, or maybe I should say strange to me. From the beginning, I never seen anyone who never, and I do mean never, put their phone down like Shanann. Meals, conversations, you name it, the phone was out. The phone caused an unpleasant incident the weekend of the engagement but we don't talk about that. The phone sent Ronnie and I pictures of our son's penis. I think it's funny how she says, the phone sent Ronnie and I. <laughs> Instead of saying Shanann, she says the phone. The phone was on and not just when she was making videos. Her parents did indeed FaceTime with them constantly. And though Chris did what Shanann said always, he didn't ever warm up to the videos and constant FaceTiming and phone pic and every single minute. We didn't FaceTime every night. It would have been painful for one thing as neither Ronnie or Chris talk much and seeing how the kids ate dinner isn't necessary. Why do they take the phone into the bathroom? It seems odd. <laughs> Sorry. But then, why did they take pictures every time the girls were at the hospital? It was all just weird. So this unattractive story neither surprises me or makes me wish we had FaceTime more. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to take a break off from this for a while. The rest of Sandy's letter concerns the last weeks of their lives, and there is a lot to tell before I get to that. I don't know why Shanann came to North Carolina for so long. They were facing losing their house and basically homelessness unless they moved back to North Carolina and in with one set or another of parents. Maybe it was to see how that would go. I'll give you a hint, not wow. Shanann looked at two very expensive houses for sale while she was here. Maybe she or they though I don't think it was they because Chris was already in love with another woman. But possibly she thought they could start over again in North Carolina like they had in Colorado. If so, I don't think it would have been easy. They weren't just broke, they were drowning in debt with little chance of getting out. They couldn't declare bankruptcy again. They were only two years out from the first one. So it really would have meant living with one family or the other. And if those weeks were indicators, God help Shanann. She must have been growing desperate. Meantime, I have to wonder what Chris's solution was. Thank you for staying with me so far. And I will answer the rest of Sandy's later on. So that pretty much concludes Cindy's response to Sandy's letter. I thought it was important to upload Sandy's letter and Cindy's response because for myself, a year and a half later, I'm still here wondering what went wrong with these two families. Where was the fallout? And clearly they both seen it differently, which is normal. But I think it's important just to see both sides of the story, um, not just the Rusex, but also how the Watts seen it. And um, I didn't realize <laughs> this video was going to be so long, but I appreciate you guys watching it. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was very long 
and just make sure you like the video it's just something free that you guys can do to support me and my channel and i appreciate all of you and i'll talk to you guys all soon bye